Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Facebook Live today. I'm so glad to see so many new faces in the audience. Uh, we're trying out a new time zone today, hopefully to cater to um, our Australian friends. I see people in the audience here from New Zealand, from Europe, uh, some from the West Coast, some also from the East Coast of America, I guess, staying up very late to watch us today. So thank you so much for joining us, uh, no matter where you are located. Great to see you here today. Uh, we have a great show today. Um, before we get to that, we'll be giving away a big draw today. We'll give away a My Heritage Complete Plan to one lucky winner in the audience at the end of today's session. For those of you who don't know, the My Heritage Complete Plan is the best plan we have to offer here at MyHeritage. Uh, it includes unlimited access to 13 billion historical records on MyHeritage, which will help you make those fantastic breakthroughs and discoveries, as well as unlimited family tree size uh, and access to all of our photo tools. That's the MyHeritage Photo Enhancer and MyHeritage in Color. So it's really a fantastic, fantastic plan, and uh, we are excited to offer it to one lucky winner. So in order to enter throughout today's show, just leave us a comment and tell us about your MyHeritage uh, breakthrough or discovery, something that you have learned about your family history. It could be um, colorizing a family photo on MyHeritage in color and noticing a detail that you never saw before. It could be finding a historical record in um, our treasure trove of historical records and learning something new about your ancestors. So whatever it is, please let us know. Leave us a comment and one lucky winner will win a My Heritage Complete Plan today. So very, very excited to give that out. Um, we have a fantastic show today. We have with us Elizabeth Setland, and she's been at MyHeritage for almost 10 years. Where, uh, she currently works on the MyHeritage research team. Uh, so she is an expert researcher herself, and um, she has made incredible family history discoveries in her own family. And that's what she's coming to tell us about today, some uh, incredible family history discoveries that she has made. Uh, in her own family and using my heritage, of course. So let me introduce Elizabeth and she'll tell us a little bit more about herself and about her discoveries. Let's get her up here. Hello, Elizabeth. Hello, hello, hello everyone. Hello, Hester. Thank you for having me here. Thank you so much for joining us. We're so excited to have you here today. I know that you have some incredible stories, so uh, we can't wait to hear them. Yes, yeah, so I can share my screen? Yes, of course. Okay, let's begin. Okay, great, we'll just get it up now. Yes. Just a second. Okay, do you see my screen? Hello, Esther? Perfect, we see it now. Okay, so let's begin. Great. So, yes, we'll, uh, we'll have a talk today about my, my heritage discoveries. So I think that everyone can hear that I'm French. Uh, I joined my heritage almost uh, 10 years ago, uh, first as a country manager for France, and then I joined the research team. Uh, I have a PhD in uh, Jewish medieval history. Um, I, I, my thesis is, about, is on the, the Jews in uh, Florence, Italy, in the middle of the 15th century. And of course, I build uh, the family trees of these Jewish family, the Jewish families. Uh, I began to work on my family history when I was 13. Uh, my father is from Italy and my mother from France, so I've been working on it for for many years. And um, 
And then uh, I, I met my husband and I will tell you, my, the discoveries I will tell you about today uh, regard my, my husband's family history. It's pretty fascinating and that's why I choose today to speak about this. Of course, I have discoveries from my Italian side, my French side, but I saw that this is really the research I prefer. I think it's the most fascinating one. So I'm, I will tell you about this today. So here you can see the right side is my um, my husband grandfather. Uh, I've, I never met him. He died in uh, 1979, but he has a very in interesting story. Left side you can see uh, also uh, my husband uh, grandfather. His name was Ruben. Uh, here is uh, with my father-in-law Danny, and so. Um, uh, Rubin was born uh, in uh, 1895 in Chernigov. It was then the Russian Empire and he left uh, his uh, native city, Chernigov, when he was 18 in 1913. Um, you can see here, Chernigov is in, uh, now it's in uh, northern uh, Ukraine, uh, close to the Russian border. At the time of uh, when uh, Rubin was uh, was there, still there, uh, <laughs> there almost 30% of the population in that city uh, was Jewish. So we're talking about almost 9,000 Jews at that time. Uh, he was one of them. And uh, and then he left when when he was 18. He left by himself. Uh, the story is that we 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 know he always uh, said that that he had to leave suddenly because he was part of a Zionist group, and uh, he was fearing to be arrested by the terrorist police. Now his father wanted him to to report himself to the police because he saw that everything would have been okay, but uh, Rubin didn't think the same and just fled. So he left, uh, he left and arrived to the United States of America in 1913. Now, when he got there, uh, you see here uh, this uh, Ellis Highland, uh, passenger list. Uh, this is, you can see, is 1919. When I began the research on him, uh, we didn't know when he got to the state exactly, because we had only this record that I could find then at the beginning. It was uh, from 1919. And at that moment, it was when he came in a second time, when he came, came back after the war, because he, he fought World War I in the um, British Jewish legend. So at that time, he's coming back. It's written, you can see that he was, uh, he was a student um, between when he got uh, in the state in 1913, after two years, he went to study at uh, Purdue uh, University in Indiana. And uh, so when he came back in 1919, he's uh, listed as a student. But uh, the truth is that he was, he spent already a few years before that and this is what I wanted first to find out. And uh, you can see here a photo of him uh, on, on this same ship, on the Cedric. And uh, so at the beginning of my research, I knew um, this, that he had one sister already in the state. When he, when he arrived in 1913, uh, Bella, uh, his uh, older sister, was already there. She was living in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And he had another brother, Moshe. Uh, Rubin is the, the youngest of the family. So Moshe was older, but uh, got to the States after him, a year after, which I find that I search and I find also uh, the record uh, on uh, Ellis Island. So these are the three siblings that left Chernigov at some point not together separately and uh, got to the states now we um, the, the the families of these three links were still in touch so from for, from for for there that from for them there was um, I, I i did the research but it was uh, uh, fascinating to find that there were more siblings they stayed behind 
and and this I, I i realized that when one day you you see this photo of the this uh, trunk this is at my uh, parents in law's house at the entrance of their house so i'm talking from tel aviv and they live also in tel aviv they are from chicago and um, so one day a few years ago i asked them suddenly what's inside you have uh, this beautiful large trunk what do you have inside and my father-in-law told me there are photos they have old papers i guess i don't remember i don't open this uh, i haven't opened this for a long time let's check and uh, uh, this the, he took this photo for me yesterday now it seems pretty clean and almost empty it looked to me like almost empty but i remembered when we opened it it was overwhelming because we find out many photos uh, dozens of old photos and family papers and there were a lot uh, in uh, in russian in yiddish uh, all the photo black and white photos that he, he couldn't tell me there were people he, he didn't know who they were and it was he was keeping saying, oh, I don't know how all this got here. <laughs> so, so I spent, it was like, you know, Christmas uh, for a kid because uh, suddenly I realized that it was a treasure trove and I had a lot to do. I spent days, weeks, months only to um, to check everything, uh, especially because because a lot of papers were in Russian and in Yiddish. And unfortunately, I don't speak Russian and I don't speak Yiddish. I had to find also people to help me understand what was written. So it was a very long uh, walk for to decipher and to understand everything. So I. Uh, it was incredible what was inside so it was there were family papers there were photos and there were also tapes and this way i find out that my someone in the family in the 70s uh, interviewed my um, husband grandfather rubin uh, about his family life and it's almost for it's it's four or five hours of him talking about his family life now it took me uh, it took me a long time to get uh, these these tapes on a digital file. Um, the the sound the audio is was terrible. So after I had to give it to a professional to enhance the quality of the sound. So it, it took a while. Uh, it's still very unpleasant, very not easy to listen, but I got a lot of information from, from these tapes also. So, so this trunk was like Christmas, you know, it's Christmas for a kid. It was amazing. Still my, my best uh, discovery uh, in terms of material like this. So, for example, uh, we find uh, uh, Rubin's uh, first ticket when he left Bremen in 1913 uh, for the first time, so from Europe to, to the States. Uh, we find a school certificate in Russian from 1911. We find his passport when he left Russia in 1913. So I don't know if you have seen uh, such a passport, but they have a lot of they have a lot of pages and so it's really fascinating it's very interesting in our case because the family name now is zetland but of course it's not the original name and i think it was the first time for the family that uh, how to spell clearly the name and to pronounce it in russian so it was a major discovery here um there, there are also a lot of army papers because as i said it was in the british jewish legion in world War one there are a lot about this um when he came back uh, after the war he went to study at the university of notre dame in um, Indiana before, as I said already, he was um, a student at the Purdue University, also in Indiana. He studied the literature and philosophy in both uh, universities. And then there were a lot of beautiful old and uh, the black and white photos that we didn't know. And my father-in-law also could recall that 
he had siblings that stayed in that stayed in Russia, but it was not clear. He couldn't remember the names or the stories. It it, it was lost in the family memory. So. Fortunately, some of them, there were names written. So I could understand immediately that uh, we were rediscovering uh, faces, lost faces of the families, and there were Rubin's siblings. So we well, here, Volod, or Tivia, or Nelia, and this, this was written that he was a nephew. So all many photos and it was it was fantastic it was overwhelming and uh, i spent the first um, few weeks taking the time to check everything and to process everything and here is the the last one that i'm showing you now is a photo of uh, rubin's parents is the only photo that we have um chaim and uh, dvora so it was really wonderful just to open this trunk. Now after it was even more interesting to begin searching about these uh, people. Uh, I you remember I showed you before this uh, record from Ellis Island when uh, uh, Ruben came back after World War One um, to the state and what was nice in the trunk that we find the ticket of this uh, same uh, trip which is really nice to see that you have the record we have a photo uh, of him on the on this ship and now we have also the the ticket anyway so what what uh, i find out in this trunk also if there was another sibling in the states shevel uh, that I didn't know about before. Um, he came from uh, Chernigov in uh, from Chernigov to the United States of Amer America in 1914, so a year after uh, Ruben, and um, he was uh, apparently very active politically against uh, the terrorist regime, uh, apparently ended up in jail. Uh, he was really uh, tormented so, so for what I could understand in the in a book uh, he wrote. He, he, he wrote this uh, play that you can see here photo. Uh, my father-in-law at that time when I opened the trunk also showed me uh, his book. Uh, you see the photo in the middle, the, the book now seems uh, in better condition. I, ga I gave the, the cover to a paper restorer to, because it was, it was kind of falling apart. And uh, when you read this play, you can understand that there was, he, he, he went through terrible things apparently, I guess, in the Tsarist regime. And um, so, and there was this, beautiful photo of him in the trunk. So I began to first doing a research that was the easiest because he was uh, in the in the States. But yesterday when I was preparing this uh, presentation, uh, I went on uh, my family tree on my heritage and I click, you know, in the profile, you, you have this button, uh, research this person. And um, I clicked and I saw a record match uh, that I haven't seen before and uh, click the link and just saw that there was a, um, the copy, a copy of the book and which is very nice uh, that there is a, a note written by, by Chevel, which for me was amazing to discover this yesterday because uh, we have a copy but he, uh, nothing is written by him. And here there is something very interesting that the first time uh, he published um, the, this book under the original family the name Titlonok, but here I saw for the first time in parentheses he wrote Sam Zetland, which is pretty new for me, for us. So you never know, even when you when you you think you're done with someone in your family tree, and you can always go back. To, you, to the profile, click on research this person and, and check finally the new, you know, smart match, record matches. And I was amazed myself. And, and you know, it's been 10 years I'm working on my family tree, on my heritage. And yesterday I said, oh my, I was so happy just to see this. But you can understand when, when we 
when you are a genealogist, uh, this all, only these little things that seem not very important for other people. <laughs> they are, they are, it was it was pretty emotional for me yesterday to to see this. So um, going back to the records, I find them. So Chevel uh, left in 1914, uh, and then I could find that he got married in 1920, and in fact in the 1930. Uh, U.S. Census, uh, here we can see him with his wife, Anna. Her maiden name was uh, Scherf, so they, they've been married, they were living in uh, Milwaukee. Unfortunately, 10 years later, uh, he was, uh, he was uh, in a mental uh, institution. Uh, and uh, we can see that he was already there in 1935. So it was, I did a um, quick research and could find this postcard. It was in this, um, in this hospital. When I spoke about this with my father, you know, he told me that in fact, he never met him, uh, even if he died when he was 12, Trevor died when my father in law was 12. But um, he remembered that once his father mentioned that, yes, he had a brother that was not well. Uh, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't know, he doesn't, he didn't know more than that. Uh, so when his uh, wife died, Anna, uh, he was still alive, still in this hospital. And uh, it was, it's sad to see that when she died, she was uh, buried uh, with his, uh, her own parents. And till now, I don't know uh, what happened with um, Chevelle. Apparently he died around 48, uh, but that's it. So he had a very, Pretty sad life. Uh, I guess he was really tormented from uh, his uh, years uh, uh, in uh, in Russia. So at that point, I had four siblings. The four siblings that uh, that left Chernigol for America at some point of their lives, and then we have siblings that stayed behind. So first, we we have here Bluma. So you have to understand that you you can hear here here that sister Bluma. So because my father-in-law told me yes, that's my mom who wrote this for me then when I was a kid, just to understand one day uh, the relationships. If if it's not clear if you don't know this, but fortunately he, he could tell me that. So this was. Uh, was new for me, of course, but kind of new also for him because he never really uh, inquired this uh, the past of his uh, father. So we have Bluma. Fortunately, they have a lot of photos with names or something written. And this uh, is another sister with her own children, another sister, Tivia, a sister in her old age that I didn't know because there is no name, if it's one of them, another one, uh, and brothers. So at the beginning, I really thought for a long time that these are two different uh, people. One is, it's written, it's Nelie, and the other one, it's Volodya. Uh, it took me uh, to uh, listen the time to listen the tapes when uh, and Ruben explained, I mean, tells the name of all uh, his uh, siblings that I realized that there were only one brother uh, left that stayed behind in Russia. So this, this two photo is the same uh, brother and his name was uh, Volodya. I still don't know this Nelie, what was a kind of a nickname, I guess, um, in Russia. I know that they have a lot of names like this. So Nelie, apparently, it's, it's, it's also Volodya. So at this point of the research, I had all these nine siblings with five in Russia that, and the contact was completely lost at that point. So I decided to track them down and it all began with Sylvia. So we have these two beautiful photos of her 
uh, only two, but they are really nice. You see that uh, on the right side, she is holding a baby in her arms, and uh, the man with the glasses is 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 her husband, and uh, and sitting is the Chevel. So they took this photo in 1913, just before Chevel uh, left, and uh, so one day I was. Um, after I entered all these uh, names in the in the family tree, I was somewhere waiting for something. It's not that I was walking at the time, but I'm used to to walk a lot. Uh, I use a lot the mobile app of my heritage, and it's very convenient because you have your families to live with you and your tr family tree everywhere you go. And uh, I had to wait for something somewhere. And waiting, usually I do this a lot. I I went uh, to, in the, to the application. I went to Sylvia profile because I was thinking a lot about about all these siblings at that time. And I just click on uh, on. Uh, at that time, I took this fo this photo for you yesterday. Search records. At that time, it was not this. I think it was also research, simply research. And I click on the button, and I began to to scroll down the the results. And at some point, I was in shock to see in one of the results the same photo. And for us, it was, you know, something pretty new, this photo. And when I click on the result, I got to a tree, a family tree on Jenny. It was written in worship in part, but I, I, the first thing I could understand immediately that it was the same of course, the same person, same photo. I could see the photo also that we have of uh, Chaim and uh, Dvora. You see down the page. So, and I was, I was in shock, and but, and I understood also immediately that this person that built the family tree knew evidently much more than me because there were uh, there are dates. The birthday, the days that were in Moscow, we knew. My my father-in-law told me that he knew that the family um, should be in Moscow in these days. So, of course, I contacted Anastasia immediately, and it was like it was incredible because, of course, she built her family tree in from Moscow in Russian, hoping to to recognize with cousins and uh, out of uh, Russia and it was incredible. We spent really uh, months that we were on a um, daily basis and in contact. It was not easy because she doesn't speak a lot of uh, English and I don't speak uh, Russian. So it was not easy. After I have to say I began to, to study Russian but it's very difficult. So at least I learned I learned to to read the letters and it's uh, kind it's very helpful when you do a research and you don't know the language, but at least you can you can manage to read the name. So I did that. But anyway, it was it was pretty emotional to reconnect uh, with um, with this uh, branch of the family. So they are in Moscow. What she could tell me is that at that time, fortunately, uh, her own mother, Anastasia mother, could tell me about another sister, and she and. We have in the trunk that I showed you before, we have these two photos, and it's written that it's one of Ruben's sister with no name. And she could tell me, she, um, Anastasia mother could tell me that uh, that's Tira when she was old with her two children, Raisa and uh, Abraham Dubratsky, and that they both died childless. So at the end, at, at that point, for Tira, I knew that the branch was closed, and that my research for for Tira was kind of over. So uh, I kept uh, focusing on these three siblings, and I decided first to focus on uh, Bloomer. I was lucky enough uh, someday to get um, um, a smart match. But first, I'm showing you. This is Bluma. So, and uh, we knew 
because listening the tapes, uh, I knew that uh, she married a cousin of her own mother, that his name was uh, Potapovsky, and that she had two sons, that one was Volodya and one was Boris, and I didn't know for the other two. But this photo of this uh, uh, nice um, guy is uh, Volodya, is Vladimir. So this is what I, I had. And uh, one day I got a smart match. I got a smart match from, um, from the Potapovsky side, uh, a Russian uh, user of my heritage, and um, I saw that he had a lot of a big tree. So I contacted him and I explained uh, about my research and who I was, that it was for my husband, a family side, and uh, lucky enough, uh, Vladimir Palais, which is the user, uh, not only uh, my heritage user, is a professional genealogist. So you can imagine that he have he has a big tree. It's very detailed, very well done and organized. And uh, so I began to navigate in his uh, family tree. Uh, because of course I became a member of the family tree, which is which is very useful. Because when you are a member of a family tree, you can go and and check uh, at um, at is the family. So I was checking what he has. It he has he didn't know a, a lot about the Cetylian oxide because uh, he knew that uh, he couldn't find. He told me that when in 1993 he went to Chernigov to search in the archives, he couldn't find uh, the branch of uh, Dvora, Rubin's mother. So he had nothing about this uh, this this branch. And suddenly I could give him a lot of information, and he could have them in his family tree. Now what I wanted is it's about. It, Bloomer, because I knew she married in her mother's family uh, a cousin, Potapovsky. And uh, so I began to, to, to check his own family tree. And, and there was a Bloomer, daughter of Chaim, married with a Potapovsky with four sons. But it was not more, no more than that. And I couldn't be sure that. Uh, that it was her. But at some point, thinking and rethinking, I decided that uh, uh, this, is, this was my only lead. So fortunately uh, enough, uh, Vladimir, uh, so the genealogist, added a few emails in the descendant profiles. So I decided to write to some of them uh, explaining my 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 research, so and then a great granddaughter Olga, so a great granddaughter of Bluma replied. She answered me almost immediately, very happy, saying that yes, because of course when I contacted her, um, I sent a photo of uh, Bluma that we have. So it's pretty obvious, and and of course she had the same. She has the same photo. So she was very happy. I was really happy also. And we could exchange a lot of information. The fact is, Olga is from Moscow, but lives currently in Virginia in the States. So it was easy because, of course, she speaks English very well. So we had no issue with the language. And so we could connect uh, very easily uh, immediately. And um, so. And this way, I, I learned something. You know, it's it's all, it's always funny when you make this kind of discoveries. That uh, she told me that a part of uh, Bluma's descendant uh, are, of course, in Israel, and they live a few miles away from uh, from us. So we could uh, we met them almost immediately uh, in uh, in Israel. So to 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 help you to understand the connection, you can see, you, you know, I'm sure you know this uh, very useful tool of the relationship report. And when you click on a family tree, you go down in the menu, you click on it, and you you enter the names of two people, and you get the, the exact relationship. It's very useful when you have a lot of people. So here you can see there is Bluma and there is Rubin. Uh, so she had one son, Boris, uh, and uh, Rubin had one son. He had only one son, D D Danny, my father-in-law. So Boris and Danny um, 
that you can see they are the same generation, but absolutely not the same age because practically Daniel and Alexander's uh, Boris, uh, Boris' son, they are they were born a, a few days apart in in nineteen. Thirty-seven. So they are first cousin once removed, but very, but they are the, they are the same age. So we connected with uh, with them immediately. Alexander is Olga's father. So Olga is in Virginia, and Alexander is in Moscow. Um, and uh, in Moscow, there is also Katya. Katya is uh, Olga's daughter. And uh, fortunately, she's an English teacher, so that was really, really useful. And uh, that was in in November. So in uh, in September 2016, uh, I uh, I reconnect with uh, blue um, with Sylvia's uh, descendants, Anastasia. And then in um, a month after, I got a smart match with Vladimir Palet, the genealogist. And then a year after, so this is uh, November 2017, I, uh, I, we, I connected with um, Bluma's descendants that you can see here, thanks to thanks to this uh, last discovery. Now, at this point, it was in November, we were so excited, I was so excited, all, almost all, all the time in contact with them, that when my husband asked me what I want for my, what I wanted for my birthday at the end of March, uh, I told him I want to go to Moscow to meet your new cousins. So we went to Moscow in April 2018. I can tell you, you can see it was kind of cold, but it was wonderful. We had a wonderful uh, week. Uh, they didn't let us to go to the hotel. They they wanted to us to to stay at their place. They have a wonderful apartment in central Moscow, two stores. So it was. It was wonderful, we had a wonderful week. You can see in the middle my husband and Alexander. So it was uh, pretty emotional. The funny thing that we discovered that we find out when, our, when we were there is that um, th this, these families of different siblings, even the ones staying, the state in Russia, they lost contact between them decades ago. Um, and then uh, when I, I Thanks to this research, practically the the families of Bloom and the family of Tivia could reconnect, and uh, and we met all together at Alexander, and and we 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 find out this way that they were living two streets away without knowing, after lost contact after having contact uh, for for decades so that was pretty nice you know it's the beauty of uh, family the family history genealogy then at that point i had two siblings that uh, two tracks still to go so volodia and dinia and then i began to be obsessed with uh, with this one volodia so listening the tapes um, I knew that uh, Rubin called him also Zehev, Wolf, so that was an indication and I began to, to search also uh, with these names. So at some point I had two uh, good leads and I think really, uh, I thought really I was on the right uh, path. I find this grave on uh, Jewish Jen. Uh, grave, you see Zev Wolf, Ben Chaim, Titleonok, and uh, and everything was matching. And I found also this uh, record on the Yav Vashem um, site, and I thought also that this could be him. Uh, you have to know that the Jews in uh, Chernigov uh, had to escape because of the Nazis in World War II. Those who stayed were all killed, and unfortunately, some of them uh, uh, were uh, evacuated. So I could understand, I thought, if this is my guy, my, if the Volodya I'm, I'm looking for, so apparently all is good, and the one was killed in the family. Uh, so, but at this point, uh, I made this collage. So I had these two photos of him with the moustache. I knew it was him. And then the photo on the grave, 
that you can see also here and and the right uh, at the bottom side of the this collage there is this photo of this guy we have this photo on the tr in the trunk and i thought there is no name no not in the, in, identified but i thought it seems it seems the same guy older you know you can you can see the ears the nose the the lips i was pretty sure that it's all the same guy the four photos uh, i showed this to everyone in the family the cousin in russia the one in israel the one in in the states no one they were saying yeah maybe but i was really obsessed and convinced that this is him but at that point i was kind of stuck i was uh, eating a brick wall and i did I know how to proceed? And I stayed like this for months, thinking about this, uh, searching in Russia, in, in um, on website in Russia. It's re Russian. It's really not easy. I didn't know what to do. Till one day, I got an amazing discovery. Um, of course, I tested I DNA testing my father-in-law because this is we can't lose this kind of opportunity because today of course when we 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 have no record it's so difficult because of the language that it's amazing and incredible that we can dna testing uh, uh, the members of family so i did it of course my family my father-in-law took the test a while ago and uh, and uh, one day exactly a year ago uh, one day I got a message from someone telling me um, I have a 1.6% match with uh, Daniel, your father-in-law. I checked your family tree and I saw a photo of my, uh, of my own uh, great-grandfather. So practically she's the, Maria, you can see here the match, uh, she's a great-granddaughter of uh, of uh, Volodya, so that was wonderful to find her. It, it's so easy because you know you search, you search, and suddenly you get you simply get a match. The funny thing is that so this this part of the family after Chernigov, they 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 went back to Chernigov, but after they left to Saint Petersburg, and from Saint Petersburg they left in the 90s to the United States and to to Germany, Maria is in Hamburg. Uh, and uh, when she saw the match, the first thing she, she did, she contacted her, her own cousins in, uh, in New York to tell them about the story. Because the uh, interesting thing of this uh, story that um, there is in uh, New York, there is Ludmila. She's a nurse in uh, Brooklyn. And uh, when she was 18, she met Rubin. Because what I didn't say is that I don't know how Rubin did that, but he managed to go back to Russia, I mean, at, at that time it was the Soviet Union, three times to visit his family. And for sure it was not easy. He visited once in the 50s, once in the 60s, and once in the 70s before he died. And um, of course, uh, he had to stay uh, very, it was always a very short visit. Uh, he couldn't uh, do what he wanted of course only the last visit in the in 72 it, it was allowed to go to chernigov but only but um uh, he was in uh, Moscow the, uh, for the three visits to uh, to visit uh, his uh, his siblings. Now, not all the time his family was ready to take the risk to meet him because you can imagine at that time to meet uh, the American uncle was kind of risky. And uh, in the tapes, and uh, I, uh, I could hear him telling the stories that uh, it was it was pretty distressful for him i i'm, I'm still amazed that uh, it was possible to do it that he could he could go there and he went three times so apparently it was really important for him to keep the contact with the with the family in russia he was apparently the only sibling that did it the, um, and but after his death the contact was was lost but ludmila who met him uh, in chernigov when she was 18 uh, remembered it very well and when she arrived in uh, in the united states in the 90s she said that uh, she tried to find him to find his family but she couldn't she went to ellis island and couldn't find anything and then 
And then thanks to this match, at some point uh, a year ago, I, I spoke with her and I spoke with her daughter, daughter Kate. And immediately they asked me something funny because they asked me how, how, how he managed. How, was he okay when he got to the States? Something happened to him? And because um, apparently she couldn't ask when she was in Russia. It was too risky. And I told her, yes, why? Why are you asking me? She said, you know, my grandfather, Volodya, always told us this story that Rubin had to leave had to flee because he was involved in the plot to assassinate the governor of Chernigov. And that, that is very funny because uh, we, we show it's not true, uh, but maybe the terrorist police really was after him or was after his uh, Zionist group. You can see the photo here that I find in the trunk uh, because of that. But I'm sure that in the, all the, hour, in the hours uh, from the tapes I listened to, he didn't mention this. I'm sure it was not true that he, there was no plot, but maybe the police was after him because they were uh, suspicious about something like this. But anyway, this is this this was funny because I realized then that is it was kind of a mythical uh, person for the family and for Volodya that he, he never met again after he left um, he, he left um, Russia. So this for the last discovery because now I have Dinya and I'm still tracking down is her descendants. So what I know about Dinya, I have this this photo with her children. And to tell you the truth, I'm not even sure that the 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 one the woman sitting um, sitting right is really her. I guess because I know that she had three daughters and uh, one son and when this photo was taken in 1925, uh, a daughter, Bonya, uh, was already in the States. She left in 1923. You can see her. She left as Bela Dubinsky and changed her name to Berta. She married Abraham Katz. She died. Uh, she she lived a part of, most of, the, of her life in San Diego. She had no children. So end of the story here. But uh, so I'm still at the moment tracking down um, Dinya's family, and uh, and I can tell you it's not easy. And I hope I'm waiting for the next match, whatever it is, DNA, smart match, record match, something to help me because it's it's of course you know it's not an easy research. But I'm getting information from people that uh, I could uh, reconnect with uh, cousins uh, thanks to uh, my heritage family trees and I'm and my, I'm getting more information that you can see I'm adding here uh, in family trees I have some names especially this one Vitali Rezni that uh, uh, is apparently a grandson of her Dinas and I'm I'm hoping I will find him soon so to conclude, I want to show you the sun chart because uh, I'm a big fan of the sun chart. So uh, you can see here the the this sun chart that I generated yesterday. So it's uh, the current uh, situation of this uh, part of my family tree, and I hope that uh, very soon I will uh, add the missing part of uh, Dinya. That's it. Thank you for listen to me i'm done esther i'm closing my presentation thank you elizabeth and that was so um so moving to see that story and all the different pieces fit together uh, just so many comments from people in the audience that say the same. I see here Christina wrote, no question, just want to say that I'm enjoying this live broadcast. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and just, just so many like that. Um, Yanka says, thank you. Very good presentation. Um, and just uh, such nice comments here about how uh, your discoveries are really a dream come true for, for genealogists. Yeah. So not just a June come true, but a lot of hard work by Elizabeth. <laughs> yeah, this is a drop of the 
the, the, the my heritage discovery is, is like a gift, you know, because you search, you search, it's so hard. And, and, and fortunately, we can get this, this matches, DNA or smart match or any, any, and whatever. And it's wonderful. And What's I a game changer? Because if not, I was still at the same point, just with photos and uh, not knowing. Amazing. I see here a comment from Linda. She says, that's awesome that you have all those treasures of photos and records found in the trunk. I've been working for several years and I'm not able to find any record or photos of my family. I'm always in awe that some people are able to find old photos of their family. So that really was such a treasure chest. Yeah, I, I'm sure this will never happen to me again. It's, you know, it can't happen only once. It's, too, it's so good to be true. Yeah. Once in a lifetime. Yeah, exactly. um, we, have, we have a couple other questions, if that's okay, Elizabeth. Sure. Um, let's see, we have a question here from Karen. She says, have you visited the town in Ukraine where the family was from? No, I want to, and uh, I'm. You know, I had to convince my husband to take me to Moscow for my birthday to meet his own cousins. You know, <laughs> so, <laughs> so no, I want. I really want to. I'm always the, you know, the first one to do these kind of things. My father-in-law, and he's he's kind of interested, but he's not. Uh, he's not dreaming of going there. I can tell you, it's, <laughs> it's it's weird to me to think about this, but it's not. But I really want to go. So. It's, uh, we plan to go back to Moscow uh, to meet the family again. I'm, and the idea is to find Dinia's family and to organize a family reunion with all the, okay. the descendant siblings. So we are waiting for the, the last discovery, my heritage discovery, I'm sure. Wow, incredible. Um, we have a question here from Carol. She says, what is your advice for genealogists who would like to tell the story of their discovery? especially when putting your images together in a presentation. This presentation has been most engaging and enlightening. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> this is really true that when we love genealogy, we can al also listen to people telling their own family history and researches. And it's always fascinating and it's always give new tips and new leads and what to do, how to do. It's always very interesting. So I'm glad I could can, could contribute in my own part this way <laughs> with my French <laughs> accent. <laughs> and do you have advice for how to tell the story chronologically or, or uh, in a different way according to the family tree? And um, Carol wants to know if you have advice for telling her story. Well, this depends on the story itself. You can see here because of the descent, uh, there were several siblings. I chose to show quickly the siblings that stay in the U that were in the USA, and then to to focus on the ones in uh, that stay in Russia. And I did I did chrono chron chronologically according to my discoveries. But I don't know if there is. I think it depends. It's different for every story. Yeah, I mean, I'm a historian, so I will tell you that to follow the, the timeline, but not sure it's the best for every story. Okay, we have a question here from Gail, and she says, I would like to know why my paternal great-great-grandfather entered the Civil War as Joseph Moore, but when he mustered out, he went by Joseph Moore Taylor. I don't know anything about him except these names and that his wife was Eliza. Do you have any tips for, for researching? Hmm, good question. So name no... changes, name, uh, I, I guess name changes is a big, a big topic and I'm sure something that you've encountered in your research. Yeah, I have to say not in the time of the civil war. So I'm uh, really clueless just thinking like this. I don't know what to say. Uh, interesting. I would have. I would need to see the records and and know more the story to understand what happened there. It, it can be really a personal story and not something that uh, that was happening. It, it's an interesting uh, question, by the way. Did you and did you encounter name changes? 
Well, yes, because uh, with my, my 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 own name now as a married woman, Zetland is is a name that they invented, and, and we don't know the story. And this is 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 really hard for me not to know because. <laughs> And it's I, my name is Zetla now, and I find that in this drink that the original name is Titlionok, and we know that at that at some point some one of the siblings in the United States decided to be more sound more American, and they choose Zetla. Why? How? When? And which of the siblings? We don't know, but it's fascinating. The, the, but it's very personal. It's really the story of this family, and uh, I, it, this, I guess, it happens a lot for for uh, in, in the states. Yes, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm, I'm um, glad they changed because it's really easier Zetland than Sitlionok. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely easier to yes. pronounce. <laughs> Um, we'll just take one last question before we give away the prize for today. Um, Carol says, my earlier question was about photos. How are you now storing and preserving those precious photos that you found in the trunk? All those photos, how do you yeah. make sure to save them and preserve them? You know what, they are still in the trunk. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't take them to my place. Uh, they are there because uh, at my own house there is a huge problem of humidity because we are by the sea and they are still there. They were there for decades because when we opened the, the, the trunk, when we opened the trunk, my father in law was in shock and said, Oh, I, I don't know about this or this, <laughs> this thing. But it was there from his own father who brought this a few years before he died. And it's really well kept, uh, preserved. So now, I, there are stuff that I took and I gave to a paper restorer, like the, the book, the cover of the book, and some uh, family paper. The school certificate was with a cello tape. So this I gave to, um, to a restorer paper just to preserve this. So I checked, and everything that was not in a good shape, I gave to a restorer paper. And I put this back, back in the trunk because I know it's the, the right temperature. I mean, my husband, you know, is a furniture restorer and he works with paper restorers. So I trust him if he says that this is good. It's it's the it's the, it's the good environment. Not to touch it always after my kids and my husband. Not to put fingers on the photos and not to touch the, the records with, you know, to protect them. So yes, be be careful of that. Wow, wow. Yeah, you want to make sure that uh, you can keep them for generations to come. That's the idea, yeah. yeah. Did, you, uh, did you scan them in? Did you scan yes, them of course. All yeah. the I charged my, it was a huge work and my, my father-in-law is retired, so I gave them, it, it, it had his place, so he had to do it. <laughs> <laughs> you gave him work. <laughs> exactly, at least, yeah. <laughs> Fantastic, fantastic. Wow, what an incredible, incredible story. Amazing discoveries. And, and I'm so glad you could share them with us today. Um, and now we'll give away a My Heritage Complete Plan to one lucky viewer. So uh, one of you will have access to all these tools that Elizabeth used in her discoveries. And we hope that uh, they'll help you advance your family history story uh, just as much as Elizabeth. So the winner of today's complete plan is, uh, let's see, Carolyn Trezona. And Carolyn wrote us, I'm so excited to use your color enhancing. I've only had a black and white photo of my grandparents. Thank you, my heritage, for bringing them to life. So a really, really incredible, incredible comment here from Carolyn. Carolyn, thank you for entering and congratulations. We'll be in touch with you through private message to claim your prize. And uh, thank you again, Elizabeth. What an amazing, amazing session. And thank you everybody for joining. You're welcome. Have a great day, everybody. You too. Everyone.